The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited, and of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Kia ora tato katoa. This is Gone By Lunchtime. Back again for 2019. And back thanks to Flick Electric Company, who sponsor the entirety of the spin-off politics content. Uh, we are enormously grateful to them and strongly encourage you to go and check out the offers that are available. You can click through on any article, um, any politics article on the spin-off um, and check it out. Yay, Flick. This is Gone By Lunchtime back in 2019 with Annabelle Lee. Hello, Annabelle. Kia ora. I'm actually Annabelle Lee Mather now. Annabelle Lee Mather. Yeah, it's official. It's on my bank account and wow. everything. Mm-hmm. Um, ben, any adjustments to your surname? Still Thomas? Tomas. No, I, d- I didn't go to Ratana or Waitangi, so I was offered no new names this oh. year. Just got the... Standard ones. Mm. Oh, I'm going to call you Tomas though, because I think it just adds something special. Bit of intrigue, mm. like a kind of Milan Kundera character, a little bit like a kickboxer mm. who's uh, avoided deportation. <laughs> um, just, just the same six names I've always had <laughs> <laughs> across my three passports, my <laughs> four government records. The big news, listeners, is we've got new microphones. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a cough. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts over the summer and I've um, worked out how to do them finally. Oh, good. The main thing is to project almost not at all. So you're speaking really close to the microphone and barely projecting and say what the time is. Go, it's quarter past three on February the 12th. We'll be right back. You know what we need to do this year? What do we need? We need to solve a murder. Can That's we... what we need to do. Put some true crime into Gone by Lunchtime. I think so, of course. But I suggested this on Twitter a while back that we should rebrand as a like a solving New Zealand supernatural mysteries, <gasps> mm. and mm. And, yes. and and but we could keep it with a political bent, and that we mm. would like. You know, we'd, we'd go down and Joe Goodhue, or because it'd be Andrew Falloon now, would help us solve the mystery of the yeah. Ashburton Panther. Brilliant. Um, the the Invercargill Pooper is the one that we need to do first. We've talked a lot about that in the office. Oh yeah, that's compelling. That's, we need to know. That's yeah. twelve parts. Mm. Get get Sarah Dowie on the case. We'll we'll go down and sort out. The re- the one remaining mystery yeah. of the <laughs> Invercargill, <laughs> the Cliff of South, of the Invercargill electorate. <laughs> oh. um, Tina Tiller is with us as ever on the dials. Hi, Tina. And, Hi. Um, we have just been watching Simon Bridges oh, and Jacinda that? Ardern. I missed that. And Winston Peters and all that lot. Missed the whole thing. Um, launch the parliamentary sitting year, haven't we, Annabelle? No, but you guys said, how was it? Ben, how was it? I came in about, what, halfway through the Prime Minister's statement. Mm. Mm. Um, She presented well. Mm. Um, After a shaky couple of weeks, she has not... She, I, I didn't think she's looked that great in her first round of public appearances since coming back from her tri- triumphant overseas trip to Davos and to the UK, um, where she sorted out Brexit for Theresa May. Um, 
sat on a stage with um, David Attenborough. Print, 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 was it was it and Meghan Markle? Was it Don't Prince know William? If Meghan was there. There were royals. Right. There were some royals, and they talked. I about, think Prince William was there. Yeah, they talked about the importance of addressing mental health issues. Mm. Um, talked about kindness. Talked about everything that New Zealand was doing, mm. or at least planned to do. Well being. Well, well-being and kindness and mental health inquiry. Once that sort of, once the tenth round of consultation on what the bureaucrats should advise the government's response to the report to be, then we will have a way forward on that sometime in sort of the mid twenty thirties, I think. Um, but but no, uh, but no. In terms of her speech today, um, it's to be a big. Page in the well-being budget to get Ben Thomas. <laughs> Did Auntie on have board, her swag bag on today? Pep in her step. <laughs> um, she looked a lot more assured. Um, yeah, I think she presented well. The speech, Toby. I don't know what were your thoughts. It was it was a pretty boilerplate kind of speech. Yeah. Um, you know the sort of thing you'd probably expect in the second year for the the year of delivery, hmm. as it's been termed. Talked about leadership a lot. Um, Talked about not not let it, not not following business as usual or, or the status quo. Yeah, uh, a little light on specifics, but that that's okay. The government's got a pretty, um, you know, the, the government has a pretty well outlined um, program for this year, which is wait for a whole bunch of working groups to report back and then, you know, go from there. And um, she telegraphed that very early in the year by saying it was the year for delivery and Simon Bridges leapt on that understandably and everyone agrees it's the year for delivery. And uh, so we will see all these working groups come back from tax onwards, some already have, and um, there'll they'll, they'll, they'll be a lot of examination about where the policy really sits, whether the legislation can get through the um, close examination of the partners in government and um, game on. Tom Bridges did quite well in his response, I thought, after a... Yeah, he was um, he was pretty fiery. You could tell the Prime Minister was obviously feeling confident, um, hot on the heels of a very good poll for Labour last night um, on TV3. And but but Simon Bridges came out with a bit of fire in his belly. Probably the best speech I've seen him give in Parliament. Some good jokes. I'd say some jokes. Well, what Don't know if he's got a new. Oh wait, uh, I wrote them down. Oh, cool. He did you? one. Um, he's, oh, he's got a bit of a groan in the office, but uh, let's give it credit. He did say that um, in relation to the fisheries reforms that Marama Davidson seemed more concerned about the sea word than the seafood. <laughs> I'm okay with that. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> I think when, when we say jokes, I think. That was the main one. That was the only joke. He did a Winston no, Peters were... impression. He did like a he did like a gravel voice. I don't know if he should roll that out again, but um, <laughs> it was a re- it was I, I thought you know it was, it was a pretty good speech in reply. Um, he, he he sort of um, <laughs> pretty, pretty technical error. I don't, should we just talk about the poll? Let's talk about the poll. Everyone wants to talk about the poll. Um, yeah, let's talk about the poll. Did you get a chance to catch the poll? Had a little look at the poll mm. and. Um, yeah, that's hurty Bernie's on Simon's heart for sure. Yeah. You can't deny that that's not really bad news for National, even though apparently Ben did try to this morning. It was um, – no, go on, go on. Um, the thing that I thought was interesting is, so what's her rating for preferred Prime Minister? It's About like 41. 41. What I thought was interesting is that – 41.8. About 42. 68% of people believe she's performing well, which means even the people that don't support her or don't support Labour think that she's doing a good mm. job, and I think mm. that is what's most important. That will probably be how Labour gets back in, is not necessarily that everybody suddenly becomes staunch Labour supporters, but like that um, she is seen to be doing a good job. Mm. New Zealanders love that she is representing us on the world stage. She um, she was quoted by TV3 as saying, you know, this th- this wasn't a reflection on her personal brand. It is uh, absolutely. The, the polling, it was, it, was, it was a team effort from all of the Labour and uh, New Zealand First Government. She's um, so which kind. Is, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of like... She's a kindie. It's kind of like, you know... When, <laughs> 
<laughs> like one of those Well-being. three-legged races, you know, at a, a parent kid day, you know, where the, the, kid, the, the parent just picks up the kid and runs them to the finish line. It's like, we did it, champ, you know? <laughs> and, um, I, th- I thought it was a, do you remember that interview she did with the New York Times where her mum talked about when she was like in primary school, she set up a happy club mm. with the rules uh, where... Um, for unhappy girls in the class, and there were mm. rules about saying nice things about each other. And I was like, "This is the this is the best indication that I think the rules of happy club are applied to the New Zealand cabinet." But, you know, I just think, like we're not leaving anyone behind. Everyone's getting credit here. I think that's actually part of her appeal because I think few people could get away with talking about relentless positivity and kindness. But I think that it is actually authentic to who she is because. Uh, and if it, you know, that's reinforced by those stories that you do hear about her. And, you know, re- politics is so ugly. I think that if she was faking it, the veil would slip pretty quickly. So, Oh, yeah, look, absolutely. What, what you see is what you get. She's, I mean, possibly the nicest human being on earth, mm. do you think? Right up there. C- certainly the nicest person on earth who makes a career out of politics. Probably the so. nicest person in New Zealand. Um, there are a number of things that the <laughs> team looks real aghast. Thanks for leaving like, me hanging. God. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I mean, like, you're fine, <laughs> but <laughs> she's dealing with a lot of pressure and is still this nice, you know? Like, and you're just. Yep. You're just trying to get Toby to record a podcast. Like, <laughs> I'm just trying to work through the issues. I just want to get through the issues, not have the nice Olympics. <laughs> can, I ha- can I say one more thing about the poll, which is one of the things that I'm curious about is the Judith Collins element. And I think it's interesting that a big deal is kind of being made of it, about her being... Um, more popular than Bridges, it's literally only 1.2%. It's like your era of margin, margin of far yeah. out. Yeah. Margin of error, excuse Margin me. of far out. But, um, but, I mean, even literally if you times that by four <laughs> together, if you add them together and times mm. them by four, it's still mm. not like coming close to Jacinda. The other thing that I wonder too is how that poll was put together. I wonder if those names are volunteered without any prompting or actually, if the poll specifically asks about Judith, because you I'm know polls are pretty put to... sure they don't give you a list. I, are I you mean, sure about that? I will double check after we've finished this recording, unless Ben can confirm or contradict otherwise. But there's oh, certainly thought, one I of them. The TV ones didn't. One of no, I'm one of them. Whether it, one or both of the Colm O'Brien and the Re polls um, do not offer you a list of names to choose from. I don't think they do in this. I think you have to volunteer them. Yeah, those, those Horizon polls used to prompt names, but I think my general best practice is you don't. If anyone out there knows the answer, call us on 0800 Gone by Lunchtime. Well, if they if they don't um, offer names to list, you'll hear this in the podcast and it will show that I'm right. If they do, then I'll just delete <laughs> it from the podcast <laughs> so as not to be exposed as a fool. But I don't think it's necessary. It shouldn't be read as a... Um, as uh, you know, a, a huge statement of support in Judith. I think instead it mm. uh, it shows a lack of support for Simon. I mean, if she I, was I around ten percent or something, I, then maybe. But I think it's more uh, you know people showing their uh, their disapproval of Simon rather than their approval of um, oh, Judith. I don't same. know about that. I, I I think that if you've any time you've got somebody who's not a party leader, or in particular, you know, actually any time somebody who's not a major party leader, but especially, you know, somebody who's in a major party but not the leader shows up in the preferred PM rankings, that's a that's a huge vote of confidence in the, the kind of media profile that they've managed to get. Um, and look, Judith Collins had it. A huge year last year. I mean, th- this, this year started off essentially while the Prime Minister was overseas with... Phil Twyford sort of running up the white flag on the Kiwi Build targets for this year and the government basically abandoning, you know, each stage of its Kiwi Build targets for the next 10 years, except for saying that somehow there will still be 100,000 new houses in that time frame, but, you know, we don't know when. Um, You know, Judith Collins has absolutely monstered Twyford on that. Um, She's, I think she's, she's really kind of rehabilitated her public image um, you know, from the point, you know, at which she was sort of, um, she resigned from the key cabinet. 
um, you know, way back when, about four years ago. So I, 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 I think it is to do with her positive performance rather than a sort of, you know, no confidence vote in Bridges. But I, th- I think you're right. When, you know, there, there was this idea that the drum beats became inexorable for Jacinda Ardern to become the leader of Labour when she catapulted over Andrew Little. At the time, yeah, she was on 10.5%. Um, that was when she became deputy leader of the party. Now, 6.6.2 is not really the same as 10.5%. Um, and, you know, even, even though Bridges, you know, 5%, you wouldn't be happy with that as the leader of a major party. Um, it's it's not that same irresistible pull right now. That I No, think but there's a direction that. of travel that's unmistakable all the same. And the question then is whether or not that support, which is out there, can be translated into the caucus. And it, although, of course, whereas in the Labour Party, um, members of the party overall get a say in the National Party they don't so that's a difference but they still obviously have an influence and I think there will be people who are saying if Judith Collins can leapfrog Simon Bridges in a poll uh, when she is not doesn't have the leadership what can she achieve with the leadership and that's what her supporters will be saying and people will be talking about it and crucially the other number these numbers have at the same time for National to go down to 41.6 as they have in this news, news hub poll, poll um, the kind of the kind of hail mary option of getting in without any support parties by dropping the other two under five through mechanisms such as ruling out or Vernon the Vernon Tarver solution, <laughs> having a sort of green blue party that would eat into the that goes. So at that point, you've got a bunch of people who are reasonably enough asking questions. That doesn't mean he's. That, 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 I'm not. I'm not suggesting that, suggesting that there's going to be a coup this week, this month, whatever. But it's it's it seems to me if this carries on even slightly that that Simon Bridges' leadership is clearly at risk. I don't I don't necessarily agree that she's redeemed herself in the eyes of the public and specifically about Kiwi Build. I think most people were pretty appalled by that personal attack that she launched on the young couple that um, had had won the ballot. And I think she is seen as someone who. Um, you know, can be incredibly p- problematic and polarising within her own party. So I- I'm not sure that she will be the, the, the answer to um, to Nationals problems. And I, I think that certainly in the eyes of a lot of the public, you know, she's seen as um, uh, unnecessarily cruel and that's, there may not be an appetite for that in, in, a, our, in our new environment of um, relentless positivity and kindness. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, some polling that was done by UMR that we published um, after Bill English announced he was standing down before the field had been um, filled um, and Judith Collins came out on top both among National Party members and uh, among the general public, but she didn't get much more than about seven or eight from memory. Excuse me. So the question is whether there's a ceiling. I think you know there are obviously people who back her strongly, who like the the strong and decisive brand that she's um, that she's herself propagated. But whether or not there is room for her to 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 charge up much further than that. Yeah, I mean, look, Judith Collins is the apex predator in New Zealand politics. <laughs> she, um, I mean, she's she's supremely adaptable, right? So in her different sort of incarnations, you know, whether it's been Crusher Collins, full on law and order, or in sort of other roles where she's had, you know, in opposition, she was the um, wealthiest spokesperson for a time, mm. and actually she, uh, you know, brought to an end the career of David Benson Pope. Um, you know, and and that and that was you know a kind of still kind of very you know very uh, steel backboned, but you know but was about sort of um, you know abuses of power or about you know about protecting the you know <laughs> protecting the vulnerable, um, and and she does have I think she has a wider kind of emotional range uh, than a lot of her critics tend to suggest um, in terms of being able to connect with the public. That said, I think it's I think it's hypothetical right now. I don't think that there is any kind of um, imminent threat to Bridges' leadership. You know, I don't think there are sort of swirling conspiracies to remove him right now. Um, but, you know, I, I think she's a strong leadership option at any point. Um, have, have people forgotten about Ayurveda, do you think? 
been? Yeah, I think that's what I, that was the sort of thing that I was kind of talking about. I think there, after she returned to cabinet um, in the dying days of the key government, um, I th- I think that there was a bit of a you know a reset um, in terms of those sort of you know that she paid her she paid her dues for that. Um, she was she was exonerated by the inquiry into those you know emails about you know the serious fraud office. Um, and you know, I, I, what I'm, about the Cameron Slater stuff? I, th- I think the that tip was line that. is that, she gained the nickname of. I mean, the, the 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 resignation came as a result of the dirty politics book. It wasn't yeah, within the book itself, but it was in that yeah, whole yeah. Mix. Well, well, and that's she right. disputed. And she disputed it, but yeah, and, to and so anyway. those emails about Adam Feely, the head of the Serious Association, whether whether she was pursuing some sort of animus against him, um, they the you know that was investigated, and you know nothing really came of it. So I, I, I think actually of of all the people you know who were part of that whole saga, you know she actually did go through an examination and um, and kind of came out the other end. And in so far as the Jamie Lee Ross saga, as it must be called, could have been seen as a kind of um, spasm redux of dirty politics, she wasn't. Associated with that, I don't think she was damaged. No, by and that, in fact, she? she was one of the, she was probably the first national MP who spoke out really strongly against Jamie Lee Ross, and you know, um, and and said that his his actions were sort of unforgivable for a caucus member. Um, she was also, I mean, if you th- if you think back to Ponytail Gate, um, was the only national MP who criticised John Key at the mm, time. Um, interesting. And so, I, you know, I think she is a slightly more complex character mm. than a lot of, you know, people particularly on the left um, tend to paint her as. You know, she does have very strong feminist credentials. I think she was the first woman president of the um, Auckland District Law Society. Um, but, but, you know, she, yeah, I, I think there is, there is a bit more to her and she has a lot more credibility um, on on a lot of the issues where she's sort of you know where, where maybe her opponents just kind of take for granted that she has sort of unsound ideas or principles um, than people might think. I think um, you know you have to acknowledge how incredibly disciplined National have been in terms of uh, their support of you know the publicly unwavering support for for Simon. Or, but I disagree with you, Ben, in terms of this poll because. I feel like it's been a death, it's a death by a thousand cuts for Simon, but this feels like more of a stab, this poll result, so. With about, if, a death, if death is a thousand cuts, would mm. you say there's like two, three hundred cuts? Like how much? How many, cu- how many cuts how many has he sustained so yeah. far? Maybe like 730, so two, two, two hundred and seventy eight. Seven hundred thirty eight. Two hundred and sixty two. But now a stab. Ben, but now where a are stab. You on the Cut quotient. How many cuts? Out of a thousand. But I reckon if you get enough sticky plasters, potentially, he could be all right. Just sort of wrap yourself up like a mummy. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, look, I, obviously, look, I, I don't think there's any way of saying it's a good poll for National. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty clearly not. The gap, which, you know, if you take out New Zealand first because they didn't get over 5%, the gap is about the same as that bad poll um, for them in that TV One had. It's about a twelve percent gap. November, between, uh, it was October, a, yeah, Later end October. of October. Yeah, it was a better one in December. And um, and and that's about a twelve point gap between the government and National by itself. Mm. And that you know, look, that's 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 a tough that's a tough um, you know hurdle to overcome. That's mm. that's big. Um, on the other hand. You know, when you look at um, when you look at polls, there's all for over a year, starting at the beginning and at the end. It's always a bit of a sort of U shape. Starts off high for the government, dips in the middle of winter, and then it tends to be higher um, as summer starts again. And I so think it's really all boozing related. Like the more booze we <laughs> we drink, the better we feel about the it's government. The, Is it's, that it's, right? it's, it's essentially the, the, the that Thomas it's, curve. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, <laughs> It, it, it's ba- yeah, yeah. It's it's basically you know people tend to support the government of the day 
um, when we are, to, to when around we're the, to around the same <laughs> level that they feel good about themselves and they feel good about themselves in their lives when they're on <laughs> holiday <laughs> in summer. And, uh, and it's true. It's true. The poll was completed um, before even White's. I think did this, did it February the second was the last last day that it was done. Um, yeah. And so maybe some of the kind of Kiwi build stuff hadn't sunk in yet. Should we talk a little bit? We've talked a bit about it, a little bit more about the Kiwi build that uh, that is obviously going to continue to be in the foreground this year. How vulnerable is this government on the Kiwi build and the promises made on that, Annabelle? I think they kind of need to get their shit together, really, yeah. don't they? In short, I, yeah, I, I think they've just made a really bad mistake by... I think it's great to be ambitious. Mm. You know, we should all be ambitious, especially when faced with such a terrible crisis. Mm. But perhaps they should have... Um, uh, focused on doing some things that might have been easier to achieve, like making sure that all of uh, Housing New Zealand's housing stock was like um, tenantable and, in fact, tenanted. Like we're still hearing stories about houses that have sat empty for years, even though there's nothing wrong with them because they need like a handrail or something like that. So maybe if they'd included that into their, you know, their 1,000 homes in the first year, including getting all of the housing stock, you know, livable. It might have been better for them, but yeah, I just think they really need to start pulling some rabbits out of the house on on um, on Kiwi Build, and it's not that it's a uh, you know I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater, but they do have to start getting people into houses. This this might be a bit controversial. Um, I think there's two propositions about Kiwi Build that are true. The first one is that it's it's failed completely, and it will probably continue to fail completely. Um, the second thing is that I don't necessarily think it will hurt them as elector uh, hurt hurt the government electorally as much as national is probably hoping. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the reason for that is, you know, just like we were talking about, you know, people are happier during summer, during barbecues. Um, the people who will be unhappy that Kiwi Build um, is not succeeding are people who are trying to get into their first homes. Electorally, that's not actually a huge yeah. number of people. Um, they are young people. They're people who are probably voting Labour anyway and will probably continue to vote Labour. Um, and, you know, the, the, the boomers, the grandpa- the concerned grandparents, you know, who, might, who, who will admit that the housing crisis is a problem, you know, it's, it's, it, because it's not a direct problem to them because of their hugely inflated asset values that they have <laughs> now, you know, to, to fund their retirements and their overseas trips um, – they're not going to worry about it too much once it's out of the headlines. The headlines right now are that you know house prices in Auckland have plateaued, um, that there could even be a slight drop in house prices, um, and that's been the case for probably the last you know two years. You know, health price house price growth is is a lot lower than it was, um, and so. You won't see the same level of panic um, in the electorate once you know once it's out of the headlines. Now that's not because houses are affordable. You know the <laughs> the fact that house price growth has slowed doesn't mean that suddenly you know thirty year olds have a million dollars to buy a house in Howick that they didn't have before. Um, they're still locked out, but it won't assume the sort of crisis proportions in the media that it's done in the past, and so I think Labour will be yeah, able but to sort of t- get away maybe with Maybe to some degree, but in terms of the kind of hurly-burly of the political argument, National aren't suggesting that necessarily the crisis will be of Labour's making, because clearly that's not the case. It's more a political management, it's a competency issue, isn't it? Yeah, there is that competence issue, and I think that's why Kiwi Build will slowly disappear from the political vocabulary <laughs> of the current government. Um, I don't did Simon Bridges said that the government didn't say the word Kiwi that Jacinda didn't say the word Kiwi build once during I think the speech. She alluded to I think she, she alluded, alluded to, to it. Housing. She talked about contracting four thousand more houses. But I think that they're just going they're going to stop using that piece of branding um, you know, to the extent that they can. Hey um do you guys want to like chip in and we buy one of those places in Wanaka? Those oh, Kiwi the ones build that ones that going. haven't sold? They're, they're gone by lunchtime. Make a, make time a share. cheeky offer. Yeah. Shh, do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Um, gone by lunchtime share. Yeah. We'll be crowdfunding for that. We can put it on Airbnb when we're not there and be like true billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other thing that happened recently was Waitangi um, and um, what do you think? And about it seemed a bit like to me a bit like a um, 
after last year, there was you wrote a great piece for the spin-off website. Oh, do you say? Oh, it that's was a very tremendous kind. piece. It was a tremendous piece. Totally about, you never said that to me before. About um, tell me what you liked about it. <laughs> 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 yeah, you made the point the the, the, the very fact of, of going there for five days and showing that the, the just engaged in conversation and taking part. Blah, blah blah. It was a big deal. And then of course, um, Cinder Dunn was the first to speak from the veranda. Mm. Blah blah blah. Lots of that sort of stuff. And then yes, this year felt a bit to me like when. There's a really good film, and they decide to make a sequel, and it's really just the same plot. But you've sort of seen it before, so it doesn't have the same. It's not quite as like the Hangover Two kind of. But thing. like the Hangover Two. Yeah, I heard that her speech this year wasn't as electrifying as what it was last year. That it seemed a bit. Um, it was fine. Yeah, it was. It was fine, but it kind of yeah. lacked her magic. But then I, I wasn't actually at Waitangi. I saw the photo of her with um, Hekinuku Mai Busby and I thought whatever the speech lacked, I think that photo probably, you know, made up for it. It was a pretty pretty cool pick. Um, yeah, it was an interesting Waitangi. Can I say a bit of an own goal in terms of inviting Don Brash? But, uh, can we talk about that? Can, because, we, can we talk about that? Cause but, I, because the, the <laughs> Titi... Marae, yeah. the lower Marae at Waitangi, which is where all the drama always goes down. That's where you have the media set piece of the Prime Minister of the day, whoever it is, being jostled by crowds and protesters and the um, the greetings are always interrupted and people have to be rushed off the Marae, you know, um, to wait in cars. And that's that's actually largely where this idea of Waitangi as a day of conflict and and drama, you know, was created in the media's eyes. And successive successive prime ministers, first Helen Clark boycotted the Lower Marae, then John Key elected to skirt around it. I think Bill English missed the Lower Marae, and Jacinda Ardern has continued that tradition. She no longer she hasn't gone to the Lower Marae um, as the entree to Waitangi. They've all actually been criticised by this, but this year when the Lower Marae committee decided to invite Dom Brash to speak, you know. It just shows – it kind of shows they just love drama. You know, they were just trying to provoke a reaction and become the centre of attention again. I I, th- I thought the whole thing was sort of kind of desperately cynical. You know, my favourite thing about that, though, is the, the, the wife of the guy who invited Don Brash, whose name is Hini Hotorini, she's like a northern legend of a woman, real staunch wahine, while Don Brash was inside speaking, she was outside on the loud hailer, like, you know, shouting it all down. And to me, that's the ultimate expression of tenoranga tiratanga. You know, everyone's allowed to have their different points of view. So I thought that was pretty cool. But why they invited him in the first place is just beyond me. I felt I, I was really disappointed, actually. I thought it was a, a stupid move to give him a platform. They, they invited Brian Tamaki as well. I mean, it it just seemed like going after. Oh, I heard after. it was like a turf war up there between Destiny and Mehingare Church. Forbes, Sorry, yeah. no, not Mehingare. Destiny Mihingare. Church for no, Mehingare Forbes. No, that was incredible. Mehingare Church, which is the Anglicans who were wearing T-shirts that said, I think it said eighteen fourteen about how long they had been there, um, versus the Destiny Church, the Man Up crew, who apparently the the sound of the motorbikes and all of that down there was horrendous. So it's, it became like a kind of weird religious tug of war, turf war, mm. more, which is weird. There was a point made by Peony Henare, who is the MP for Tamaki Makoto, but is in Apuhi as well, and is very Ngāti closely Hine, connect, yeah. connected with all, all of everything that happens at Waitangi. Um, he made a point, which is interesting, about there being a danger that the events that happen at the Upper Marae now, which are really beautiful mm. and quite serene, and very respectful, and there, I mean, there was one very short protest before the start of the Porphyry that was sort of dealt with quite quickly and, and um, respectfully. And then down on the Lomarai Titi, there's all this kind of a much more a sense of both chaos, but also a party, you know, like, mm. all, I mean, certainly on the 5th. And the thing that Penny Henare said was that there was a danger that the Apamurai start seeming like an elitist yeah. affair. Yeah. And uh, that, that that they had to be alert to that in the yeah. years going forward. Because once it doesn't stops being novel and starts being a it's sort of there's a, there is is that a real 
oh, a I, real thing? Do you I think? hadn't actually thought about it, but yeah, I think that's an astute observation. Good on him. Ben just Ben Ben. Any thoughts ben. on that? You, you just. I, I I think that the Lower Marae has been a circus for a long time now, and that if they if if the committee wants to bring you know formalities back there and and become you know an official part of the program again, um, they need to you know I, I think they need to show that they want something other than just a circus. And I don't think inviting Don Brash and Brian Tamaki and promoting it through the media um, is the way to do that. I don't know if I think if it would have been like that this year if Kingy had been there. I'm not sure if he would have. I, I find it hard to believe that Kingy Todua would have been supportive of Don Brash coming myself yeah. or, or, or the Man Up stuff. Mm. Missed him this year. It's not. It feels strange to have Waitangi without him. Um, another Waitangi institution is, of course, Shane Jones, who's in charge of the Provincial Growth Fund and um, in the days before Waitangi was... Um, and the pre-Waitangi boil-up? Piss-up. Um, the, 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 um, there, were, there were various announcements, um, um, distributions of parts of that money. How's that looking, do you guys reckon, in terms of... I mean, it just strikes me that it, two of the boldest parts of the government's plans are Kiwi Build and the Provincial Growth Fund, both with um, being run by ministers, whether it's Phil Twyford or New Zealand First Shane Jones, who are, we might say, confident men, um, possibly sometimes risking hubris. Um, and I guess um, I want to ask you whether my little pet theory that that those are, that forward makes that therefore makes them vulnerable is is a real one. Well, National have been bandying about this figure that, you know, 54 jobs have been created by the Provincial Growth Fund so far and 118 jobs in Wellington for bureaucrats administering it. Um, similarly, Kiwi Build, there's been about two, two or three new departments set up for it um, and, you know, 40, 47 houses built. Um, so, I, you know, I, th- I think that um, there's... <laughs> You'll action that. Uh, <laughs> the, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, there, you know, there's there's two theories about the provincial growth fund. One is that you know it's sort of like that an '80s movie called Brewster's Millions, um, <laughs> where where a poor guy finds out he's secretly inherited. I remember that. You know, untold wealth, but he can only inherit it if he spends something like. Ten million dollars in ten days, and he's not allowed to buy anything of value. He's just got to spend it on parties, so that, to teach him about how how it's you know to be <laughs> sick of money. He'll be so sick of money by the time he inherits you know this vast wealth, um, and you know, and and you you could almost sort of see this as like you know is, is this the is this Shane Jones's karmic punishment from the gods saying you, know, you, you want it to be this czar of like irresponsible spending now you've got to spend three billion dollars before like the next election and you know is he just going to drown in it you know but of course they really um, don't want to spend the, the, the lion's share of it until election year right like that's when you're the, the, and when yeah that, well that's really the, that's the, the other theory right is that three billion dollars is going to be blown in election year in key electorates, um, you know, where we are New Zealand first think they've got a tilt. Yeah, well, New Zealand, I, I mean, I mean, I mean to, just pre- New Zealand first polling well under 5%. They often do in the, in the, at this sort of point in the cycle. But, yeah. you know, they need to do something. Right? They, they've got a real challenge because, yeah, sure, New Zealand first always poll poorly between elections. But every t- the two times they've been in government before, they haven't cleared fi- the five percent threshold in the next election. They don't have an electorate seat now, you know, unless they're literally just going to buy all of Whangarei and then you know move move their committee into <laughs> use the provincial growth fund to like <laughs> create a small satellite city in Northland, which will be exclusively um, you know populated by New Zealand first voters or something. I don't know, but it, it, they're you know that yeah they, they they do have that real challenge i mean and and the thing, when you think about the scale of the provincial growth fund it's easy to sort of think oh 1 billion dollars that's only about 1% of all government spending per year that's that's nothing right but then if, if you compare it to the the long suffering support party the greens they have a 
$100 million green investment bank as part of their uh, their agreement with the government. And that's $100 million that the government has given you know, to this bank that will lend on commercial interest-bearing terms to any project that can show that it has a demonstrable business and environmental case mm. backing it. Mm. $100 million over three years. Uh, whereas <laughs> New Zealand first have been given $3 billion to literally just spend however Shane Jones wants. You know, the scale of this thing is actually staggering. Um, and unless, I think unless, you know, unless, you know, he wants to move the port or, you know, create a new railway link, um, it's going to be very hard to actually spend that much money. Well, yeah, the, the, the connection of Northport to Wellington and what that requires will surely be part of what goes down. I, I, I th- you'd, you'd have to expect that, yeah. Um, the, 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 the other thing that was mentioned in the speech today and that has been a thing hovering around this week is uh, foreign policy or um, China, really, in terms of the headlines. The front page uh, splash on the Herald this morning was about um, uh, China p- postponing a state visit by Jacinda Ardern and about um, postponing a tourism project. And then we had the intriguing aeroplane that was turned around half the way to Shanghai, I think, um, which is very puzzling to understand, something to do with getting the paperwork done and something to do with mentioning Taiwan and who knows what. Um, It does feel like in the midst of a kind of burgeoning trade war, whatever you want to call it, war between superpowers of the United States and China, that New Zealand um, is going to have to make some calls. Yeah, so, you know, obviously Trump and the, the tr- Trumpist America and Beijing are in, engaged in a, a trade war right now. Um, that takes place around the same time uh, that China has been quite strongly asserting its strategic interests in the Pacific. You know, this Belt and Road uh, initiative that they have, investing a lot of money in the Pacific Islands. Um, you know, which have traditionally been in our sphere of influence, in the in the Anglosphere, I suppose. Um, it, it is pretty hard to write all of this off as a coincidence. It's very difficult. Um, the, the the prime minister's visit to Beijing last year was put off mm. uh, at the end of last year. Um, her current trip is, you know, currently any visit is doubtful. Um, a, pro, a tourism project that was agreed between the, you know between New Zealand and China back under the key government, uh, which was going to be announced, I think, next week. Barry Soper has brought news that uh, that that's that's just off mm. that announcement, and the plane being turned around, you know, supposedly about paperwork. Although Hamish Rutherford at Stuff wrote a piece about this, saying that it was because they mentioned Taiwan in the paperwork, but apparently that issue was first raised in 2018. So you know this this. It's pretty hard to avoid the idea that this was kind of a technicality or a long-standing grey area that was seized on. It's one of those things that's happened in the past in terms of um, exports of goods where they're held up at the border over owing to what seem to be minor technical issues, and then um, but, but it's they actually, hard to know whether you're doing trace back too to much sort of Kremlinology about whether they're actually sort of messages that are being sent. Right? I, I mean, we saw this when there were investigations into. Um, Chinese steel mesh that was being sold in New Mm. Zealand. There was a dumping complaint about that, and suddenly New Zealand kiwi fruit started running into a lot of um, regulatory problems over in China. So, you know, there has been a lot, there's been quite a bit written about this that, you know, strategically, militarily, our interests are with the United States, trade and commercially, they are with China. You know, the amount of trade we do with China is huge, dwarfs dwarfs the United States by a long way. But, and and the, the idea has always been to keep these two things separate. But what that sort of misses is the idea that China doesn't keep these things separate. These things are inextricably linked with China, for China. Mm. Their strategic dominance, you know, and their strategic sort of outreach into the Pacific is all predicated on economics. It's all predicated on pumping money into the Pacific Islands and actually pumping money into New Zealand. So you can't, it, it 
we've always maintained what I think is a polite fiction that we can disentangle these two things, that we can go with China for trade, United States for military and strategic support. Um, that's looking increasingly less like plausible. Annabelle, you got anything to add on that front? No. Nah. Um, Annabelle has been <clears throat> vandalising my pad and um, I'm going to go and speak to a lawyer. Uh, that's <laughs> gone by lunchtime. Uh, we're going to be back real soon, maybe even this month. Thank you, Tina. Thank you very much to Flick Electric Company. They're our dear friends. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Annabelle. Thank you to you, listener. I'm Toby Manhire, and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up a total election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards the <laughs> There's radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBee. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.